thank you. Um, Rob, a little bit like you, 20 years ago, it was very easy for me to be identified as an artist, to sit in a studio, to be covered in smeared paint, to smell of turpentine, <laughs> glue, wood shavings perhaps. And uh, while my inspiration was many and varied, my technologies and my tools were pretty simple. I would hold uh, something like this, a palette and a pencil, a charcoal, a paintbrush in the other hand. And I worked in a typically kind of conventional space. There was an easel and there were objects all around that I used for inspiration. So the works themselves were sculptural, they were installational, they were paintings, they were portraits, they were lines, they were things that I could arrange and put together in new forms. And we pretty much identify them as art. I started my life studying drawing. And Brett Whiteley was one of my favourite heroes, one of the great Australian painters. He was uh, quoted as having said, the drawing is the art of being able to leave an accurate record of the experience of what one isn't, of what one doesn't know. A great drawer is either confirming beautifully what is commonplace or probing authoritatively the unknown. I thought about this for a while. Thankfully, art is dynamic and it evolves over time, just like people. And I had registered and recognised that the work that I was doing was kind of commonplace and it was very reflective of the life in which I was living. We are now so accustomed to being enmeshed with art as a process, as a product, and as an artefact, that like our tools and our technologies, our iPads and our mobile phones, it is becoming increasingly difficult to separate the art from the artist. So today, when I invite you into my studio, it could be anywhere, from a laboratory, of stage, a virtual and network system, completely immersed in high tech or no tech at all. My practice extends from the translations from the depths of the ocean to, to areas where uh, possibilities where I'm immersed and saturated by nature and culture or completely removed from it. It's the ex extremes of these spaces that I'm most interested in. And it is the ideas themselves that challenge me to concentrate, to consecrate, and to focus my ideas in numerous ways. In a way now I understand that there are no rules, there are no limits. So for a person who is deeply inspired by the space analogue environment of the ocean, and I'm captivated by human performance behaviours and limits underwater. I must be willing to take a risk. I must be willing to dive in, to completely immerse myself in those kinds of spaces, to shut out the white noise and the hum of pedestrian, urban, metro metropolitan life. So the development of my particular live laboratory style performances and art exhibitions have been inspired by these beautiful spaces and this fascin fascination for human exploration. From the peaks of our highest mountains to the depths of our deepest ocean trenches and imaginings the speculative future that we might have when we one day engage with those spaces as our permanent homes and habitats. So the results have been this poetic body of artwork that almost explore the aesthetics of a life support system, reflecting not only our individual spaces, but the spaces of our entire global system and that relationship that we have with the universe beyond. These performances become raw and poetic, almost neo-human in the kind of physical language that describes the humanness of being in a space in these kinds of con confines and reaching and meeting these types of extremes. So while I work with the 
psychological and biological transformations, and I'm interested in the, bio, the body shocks of, of these encounters to, to understand or deepen an understanding of the protocols, the technologies, and the requirements of explorers and researchers in these fields. I also work with other practitioners. I work to critique, to question, to challenge, and to understand the systems in which we explore. Now I have, uh, in collaboration with biotechnologists, with underwater technology engineers, composers, dancers, new media artists and so on, we can be provocateurs. We can ask questions and challenge audiences in new ways. Here's a piece that we worked and created for the International Symposium of Electronic Arts inside the, a fully closed uh, lifeboat with a full biotech laboratory. We'll hear some of the sounds from the work now. We processed participants coming to the work. We took samples of their DNA. We interviewed them. We gave them a psychological profiling questionnaire. We asked them to participate in the support of uh, uh, tissue culturing and to add their samples to this meta-DNA, this meta-culture of data and biology in this big mash of environment. <laughs> The Lifeboat crew can track your progress using state-of-the-art tracking and surveillance systems. Visitors are ensured that our computerised QA64 response processing system, inclusive of cameras and microphones, will be with you every step of the way. Your progress will also be broadcast throughout the cruise ship opera and relayed to ICR 04 conference headquarters in Helsinki. So for the most part, my work is typically autobiographical and it's multidisciplinary and it's collaboratively uh, built. And this approach to art making and, and this approach to research is deeply seated within the tr traditions of, of art and discourses in these areas, yet within the context of other fields, for instance, other types of research and academic fields, or even big industry and big business, these types of subject, subjective approaches are sometimes considered <coughs> highly experimental, even unethical. Novel, perhaps, disruptive, perhaps, and that can be a good thing. In fact, that can be precisely the gift, the strength, and the promise, and that the experimental nature of artists can embody and provide for projects. So for my work, for, for the most part, I must literally dive in. I work full-time as a commercial diver for many months of the year in remote locations. It's not always glamorous work, and it's a very different type of studio setting. <coughs> I also collaborate with other technologists, underwater technology engineers, with composers, dancers, new media artists, and more recently, with astronauts, gamers, and programmers. The context in which I'm working is always changing, but my responses and my desires and that which I communicate with the audience is that very human, visceral, raw and personal engagement with these kinds of spaces, these extreme spaces and our technologies. Now by noticing significant moments in new, in new works of art, seeping into every fabric and context across our culture, our nature, and our politic has given me the confidence to rec recognise that the life of an artist in very real terms cannot be contained. And technology in part enables and helps enable that to occur. But in essence, it is the ideas themselves that give us fuel. And they can be liquid, they can be fluid, they can be powerful, and in fact, they can be hydrating. So after I finished my PhD in visual art, I actually went off and continued to study, much to the disgust of my family, I think, or surprise, perhaps, is a better word. And I went and studied at the International Space University in Strasbourg as the first artist, followed by some graduate research at the NASA Ames Singularity University program. And it was in this context that I think that I first actually learned about being an artist. 
It was in this context that I had to learn a whole new lexicon. I had to find a new language, and I had to find new ways to articulate, to justify, and to communicate not only the form and the content, but the intent, the relevance, and the existence of my very practice and my way of being in the world. So that I could talk about the tools, the processes, the artifacts, and the languages that were being derived of art and the benefits that they were bringing. So simple phrases in those contexts, such as art or architecture or research, have an entirely different meaning in space. And it soon became clear, however, that I was the kind of person who was able to bring crazy ideas to life. I did know how to prototype. I did know how to work at all levels of a process in a really hands-on way. And my training in hospitable underwater environments did actually have some analogous uh, relationship to the type of activities and the type of work that astronauts were doing and performing in these types of extreme spaces, unconsciously or not. So naturally, I jumped at the chance of leading the NASA-sponsored research project under General Pete Warden, for, called Lunar Gaia. And our brief was to architect and design a lunar mission habitat that would enable a human outpost to be put on the moon and to demonstrate a closed loop life support system. And yes, photosynthesis was very important to the system. We also had to include, we had to build an infrastructure that allowed groups of people to be able to come together to have dinner in the evenings, that, that enabled people to be able to communicate, to be surrounded by beautiful art, and to be able to have full well-being in these kinds of spaces. So we'll just have the video play. <coughs> So throughout this process, I was able to give kind of this human and philosophical feedback to the kind of human factor requirements to a group of scientists, of engineers, of policy makers, of entrepreneurs who participated and supported in making this vision, or I guess realized or achieved in our minds. And it fed back into my art and vice versa. So through this process, I was able to understand that a critical habitability consideration for long duration space flight is the need to understand the specific consciousness of both the zero gravity and the microgravity conditions on the human body. So this consciousness is the balance between the forces to affiliate and the forces to withdraw from these inner and outer spaces. This is the type of relationship that I had been exploring in my own work <coughs> performatively. And from a research perspective, it was very important to ask as well, it's just what this balance implies for the living systems in space. How is it recognised and communicated? And how does it really mimic that which we have here on Earth? Because we are not separate from space, we're in fact in space. So in 2001, I participated in the very first topical team with the European Space Agency for Art and Science. I'm now a co-chair and representing the Australian, the Antarctic and the Oceanic region with this group, and we're working towards an ESA arts initiative. So the history of artists working in space with space flight and ground-based space analogues is rich and varied, and it demonstrates that the skills, insights and approaches that artists make are, are contributing of great value to not only space communication, education and outreach. Outreach is this, it's more of a US term to describe anything that's connecting with new audiences. But also working in cooperation with scientists, engineers and technologists from NASA, from ESA, from JAXA, and Australia, I can honestly say that every space project needs an artist. Now, I understand these things take time. NASA has uh, had a space art program now for 50 years, 
And it was only of April 2013 that uh, they, were, they released the first ever page on the NASA website with a dedicated gallery being able to show that, which is fantastic. So as artists, we have a duty to create, to form, and to architect, to reveal and to share the human experience. And because we artists, like all of us here, understand the human role in making space accessible, relevant, and indeed possible. Our communication, our community embraces unique and innovative pathways. Human curiosity, desire, communication, research, and exploration enabled by experimental and creative and cultural practices. I continually advocate that there must be aspects of art and science cooperation that contribute, inspire, and support the advancement of space and space-related activities that will provide multiple spin-off technologies and creative strategies for enhancing the quality of life on Earth. Put yourself in my shoes just for a moment. And why not imagine artists working at every corner of this country and of this globe and indeed the galaxy? Now, being an artist gives me the kind of wings that I need to imagine, to ask questions, to embody ideas and to make new things happen. And yes, it's no secret. If you get anywhere close to getting inside my headspace, you will know that uh, I really do wish to undertake an artist res residency in space one day. And perhaps even a lunar expeditionary residency as well. And I have every confidence in my colleagues who are engineering these kinds of th realities as we speak. And I actively participate also in ground-based space analog research and training activities here on Earth towards these dreams. As real collaborators, as explorers and, and inventors, artists can truly move science and engineering forward by co-creating artworks that they can improve science and technology communication. Australia's first space policy was released in May 2003, and it is my dream that we shall work towards Australia's first space arts policy by 2015 as one small step towards a human and cultural presence as part of this sector. What do you see when you glimpse into the future? Let's be the pilot of our own research. Let's be the pilot of our own dreams. And let's de dare to work together in bold, uncertain and radical ways. Thank you.